everybody. We're continuing with our story Coming to England and we're on chapter six and it's actually called Coming to England. There was always talk of someone who'd left the island, who'd gone to England to be met with open arms. Fantastic stories of how life was wonderful and how much money could be made, of how the islanders were wanted and needed to help Britain build herself again after the, in the years after the war and how people could better themselves overnight. The streets were said to be paved with gold. Life was far from unbearable in Trinidad, but many people were tempted by these stories and couldn't resist the opportunity. Not only unskilled workers, but artists, writers, musicians, students, as well as assorted intellectuals made the decision to leave their tropical island home. As children, we didn't really take much notice of all this talk. It was almost like the stories Daddy had made up for us. But all of a sudden, the stories got very close to home. While in bed one night, Sandra and I overheard Dardy telling Marmy that he wanted to go and make a new life in England. He was frustrated by not being able to play jazz, the music he'd heard so much about but got such little opportunity to play because the music in Trinidad was calypso, Latin and steel pan. A friend who'd settled in England had written and told him he could not only get a chance to play jazz but also make a lot of money. The discussions went on and on into the night and over the following weeks, newspapers advertising jobs and boat journeys to Britain were left around the house. Some nights in bed I could hear Marmy crying, saying that she would never leave us. I felt so reassured by those words. They were my only comfort during those restless nights. I started to have dreams, bad dreams, nightmares of being left alone, falling with no one to catch me. I didn't tell a soul about my dreams and anxieties. If I did, then perhaps they would come true and I didn't want them to. So I kept silent, pretended I didn't know what was going on. But the talk of it going to England never stopped. Then finally, it was decided that all eight of us couldn't go at once. So Daddy would go first and send for us later. I was so relieved that Mommy wasn't going to leave us too. I was sad to see Daddy go, so I cried a little when he left. But was soon back to my old self. Life hadn't changed much as Mommy was still with us. Things were almost back to normal. No more constant talk of going to England. But then the unthinkable happened. Marmy started asking family and friends if they would look after us because she was going to join Dardy in England without us. I was devastated. She was going to break her vow. She said she would never leave us. I wished night after night that it wouldn't happen. I thought my wish had come true when none of my family could take us. They all had too many children. Grandparents usually took care of the children when parents left for a new world, but that was not to be the case with us because we had none. Mummy began to sell the furniture and all her jewellery, as well as the silver we got for our christenings. She started singing in her own special way, the same song she sang before Dardy left, and now she was singing it again and again. This is the hour when we say goodbye. Soon you will be sailing far across the sea. When you're far away, please remember me. She'd start to cry and hug us while she sang, and then we'd all start to cry. I couldn't understand why she wanted to leave us. If she loved us, why couldn't we all stay together, especially as no one wanted to take care of us? But she kept telling us that she did love us, and that's why she was going to England, to try and make a better life for us. We couldn't all go together because she and Daddy didn't have enough money, but one day they would. And unexpectedly, two of our godparents said they would take us. We couldn't stay together, though. Lester and Ellington would stay south in San Fernando. Sandra and I would go north to Tunapuna. The lucky two were Cynthia and Junior, the two youngest, who would go with Marmy to England. And this was the day when a veil of unhappiness came down onto my life. To be separated from Daddy was bad enough. He had now been gone for a year. But to be separated from my beloved Marmy and my younger brothers and sisters were at the end of the world to me. My unhappy world was beginning to crack and break into pieces, drifting away from me like flower petals scattered on a pond. We were all so very close, we played together and had no other friends. Life was going to be sad and lonely, and that soon proved to be true. Look at that picture there. The people who looked after Sandra and me, we called them auntie and uncle as a sign of respect, even though we weren't related, treated us like servants. Lester and Ellington were treated even worse by the people who looked after them. They had to fight each other for food, winner take all. 
They worked hard in the day and at night were forced to sleep, not in a bed, but under it. We were told every day that we were lucky to have someone to give us a home and that we should be grateful to them because we could have ended up in an orphanage. Later, Marmy told us that twice a month she'd sent us money, clothes and parcels, but we never saw any of those. Instead, we had to work from five o'clock in the morning, cleaning the house, preparing meals and washing all before we left for school. I was so tired I didn't learn much at our new school, but I remember Sandra and me being bullied because we were newcomers. I was a good fighter and I fought Sandra's battles for her too. One of the most embarrassing moments I had was when the elastic in my homemade knickers snapped as I ran to school to avoid being late. The knickers landed at my feet and all the children started laughing at me, especially one particular boy. I was so angry and humiliated that I lashed out at him. He was bigger than me, I didn't care. I must have looked and acted crazy because from then on no one ever laughed, teased or bullied Sandra and me again. After school it was no fun, except when we walked home during the mango season. The mango trees would be laden with ripe juicy fruit. It looked so tempting and irresistible that Sandra and I would risk all to get some of the sweet mouth-watering fruit. We'd climb over the fence and pick as many mangoes from the drooping branches as we dared before the owner chased us off. If the mangoes weren't ripe, we'd both get tummy ache from eating them. One day, on our way home, we saw the preparations for a funeral. A local man had died and neighbours were encouraged to go in and pay their last respects. Sandra and I persuaded each other to go in and pay ours. I didn't know what to expect or quite understand why I was going in. The truth was I didn't want to go home and anything to delay us for just a blissful moment was more than welcome. So we shuffled into the hushed room where the open mahogany casket was laid on the table. I slowly edged forward until it was my turn to say goodbye. I looked down at the old man's face and was so surprised at what I saw. It was the most peaceful and serene face I had ever seen. He didn't look old and wrinkled, but contented, almost smiling. I smiled back at him and I whispered goodbye under my breath. I wasn't scared, but happy that I discovered something that up until then had been the unknown. The atmosphere at the funeral was quite different. This was when the mourners let their feelings out. They cried and wailed. Some even threw themselves across the ca casket. Later that evening, the family had a wake to celebrate his life and give him a good send off. It was just like a party. And there was nothing for me to do to celebrate when I got home. Only ironing clothes, picking the husks off the rice, sweeping the big dusty yard and collecting the eggs. I remember once having to catch a chicken, wring its neck, pluck the feathers and prepare it for dinner. I hated doing it and cried myself to sleep that night. In fact, most nights Sandra and I cried ourselves to sleep. We wrote to Marmy in England, but our letters were always vetted and the lines crossed out if auntie and uncle didn't approve of what we wrote. After a few months, we moved to a new house with an inside bath and toilet. Auntie bought all the latest gadgets, a fridge, an electric iron, you name it, she bought it. She was a very superstitious woman and each day at the new house, Sandra and I had to go through the bizarre ritual of waking up at four in the morning and sprinkling holy water around the house, especially across the doorway, to ward off evil, evil spirits. I couldn't really understand why we had to do this as we were being treated in such an evil way inside the house. To me, the evil had already entered. It felt as if our sentence of unhappiness was gonna last forever. I prayed and wished for the day when I would be with Marmy, Daddy, and all my brothers and sisters again for the happy, carefree days of family life which gave me such a feeling of security and confidence. I'd lost that feeling and I longed to get it back. I shall see you for the next chapter shortly.